may be seated. Verse 8 of our gospel lesson says, Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Would you bow with me as we pray? Lord, we pray that once more the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and redeemer. For we ask it through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, I've heard people say, perhaps half jokingly, perhaps half meaning it, are we living in the end times because of everything that's been happening in 2020, from the virus to the economic troubles that we've been having to that sense of the increase of lawlessness, which I think that I can see exactly why some people might think that, to the sense of wars and rumors of wars, at least uh, the tr tensions that we have continuing with China and other countries over across uh, uh, all around the world, geopolitical issues. Uh, all these things coming together to the divisions, the tensions that we have in our country. Uh, I can hear him saying it again, sometimes half jokingly, but wondering if there's a little bit of truth there. Is this the end? And my answer, this is my own personal answer, is yes and probably no. And I say probably no to hedge my bets because Jesus himself, as to his humanity, said, I don't even know, right? As to his human nature, he said, these times have been placed in my Father's hand, and so anyone who would claim to know would claim to know more than, than Jesus himself as, to, as, he, as he walked and walked and acted as a man on this earth. But I say probably no in the sense of the final end of all things, because so often when we're tempted to think it's the end of the age, it's because in our particular location we're experiencing a lot of things that we haven't experienced before. But we have to keep in mind that all over the world, it's not always been the case where people have known the relative peace, tranquility, and order that we've known in our country. Just this morning, I looked at the Christian Post, a Christian news website, and they talked about how in China, 200 communist uh, uh, leaders uh, went into a church, beat up all of the Christians, and tore down their church. And that kind of thing is happening all the time in China. Intense persecution of Christians is on the rise in China. In North Korea, there are statues of Kim Jong-un, the current leader, and of his father, and everyone is made to bow down and worship them, just like they were made to bow down and worship an image of Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, they don't take no for an answer there, if you know what I'm talking about. And so if anyone had the right to feel like perhaps they're living under the power of Antichrist spirit, it would be in these places. And yet, uh, here in the United States, we still have a lot of freedoms as we're looking towards the 4th of July and a lot of things that we uh, still enjoy. Paul, talking to uh, the Thessalonians, when they had thought, they had thought, we are living in the last days. They even said that. They were saying that, the Thessalonians. This is the day of the Lord. They said it had come. And he said, I don't want you to be de deceived into thinking the day of the Lord has come. That day will not come until the man of lawlessness is revealed. Many equate him with the Antichrist of John. I, I agree with that, but I'm, I know there's a lot of different opinions on that. And then he says, that man of lawlessness will not be revealed until that which restrains lawlessness is taken out of the way. And then some equate this one with Jesus when he says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be with the coming of the Son of Man. That is, in the days of Noah, the world had become so filled with lawlessness that it was so obvious that it needed to be cleansed of its ugliness. And the picture there is, is that before God brings this world to an end, he's going to let the truth about human nature be exposed once more, once for all, so that just like before the time of Noah with the flood, people will say, oh, you need to do something about this. And there won't be any argument about it. They'll all know that something has to be done. And so sometimes when we see lawlessness in the world, we are tempted to think that maybe we're at the end of the end. But again, I don't think that we are not yet. I, I can imagine under Stalin, people thought that when millions upon millions of your countrymen were being rounded up, brought to gulags, and killed, millions upon millions. No doubt when Hitler rose to power, many thought, this is the final straw, this is it. And that day is coming. But we're not living, I don't believe we're living in a time, in fact, I think we're living in a time very different from that. A time in which the end has begun. It's begun with the breaking in of this thing that Jesus calls the kingdom of heaven. But with the breaking of the kingdom of, the kingdom of heaven, just the opposite is happening. Not the expansion of lawlessness, 
but the growth of the reign and rule of the kingdom of God. Now that's very hard for us to hear because we've been living for 2,020 some years A.D., right? And because we've been living 2,020 years A.D., we don't really have a... We've, we're far away from what it was like B.C. To help us think about what it was like B.C., we need someone who spent a lot of time studying B.C., a man who has done that is an English writer. His name is Tom Holland. Went to Cambridge University, and he first began wanting to be a writer, being a novelist. He wrote many novels. But as a young person, he always loved the Greeks and the Romans. And uh, he lost his faith as a child, and he came to the conclusion that he, wasn't, he didn't believe in all this Christian stuff. And he wanted to study the Greeks and the Romans because he thought Western civilization owes everything to the Greeks and the Romans. And so in 2003, he wrote the book Rubicon, The Last Years of the Roman Republic, where he really delved into the history of Rome. And he wrote a popular history as a novelist uh, that really connected with people, won many awards, and was praised by professional academic historians as being a, a terrific history. He also wrote Dynasty, The Rise and Fall of the House of Caesar. And... Uh, a book about Islam. And one of the things that uh, came out of all this, some people said, but his writing is really good, it's vigorous, but he gets into all the lurid details of what life was like in the Roman world. And a lot of people, didn't, they didn't like the nasty, ugly, brutish picture he painted of the world B.C. But if you watch interviews of him, he said he wrote those things because he didn't know all of those things. And as he was studying and he was immersing himself in that world, he recognized nothing of his current world in those Greeks and those Romans. And his old belief that Western society owed all of its glory and debt to this Greek and Roman foundation, he could no longer believe it. And he said even as he studied Islam, he couldn't recognize his his values and the Western values in Islam. And that began to, he wrote, and then he wrote a, an article for the New Statesman, Why I Was Wrong About Christianity. Because he came to realize more and more that the reason why the world was different in A.D. versus B.C. What are some of the things that he talked about the world was like B.C.? Well, for one thing, he said, if you were a free Roman male in that world, you had the right to have sex with any person who was under you. And so, you know, a very large proportion of the Roman world was enslaved, and all those slaves were ipso facto sex slaves. And it was nothing for a free real Roman to have sex with any of his slaves at any time, male or female, in any way that he wanted. He dominated that world. And so it was like a world filled with sex slaves. He brings up that all of the Greek gods and all of the Roman gods all committed rape, and they were all examples to the free man of what they could be and do at any time. When a baby was born in a Roman household, the boy was laid before the father. And if the father picked up the boy, he lived. If the father refused to pick up the boy, he was set outside to die. If a girl was brought before the father, the father either acknowledged or didn't pick up the girl or didn't acknowledge the girl. And if he didn't acknowledge the girl, she was set outside to die. We have a letter from that time period where the man very nonchalantly is on a business trip and he writes home and he says to his wife, if you have the baby for, before I come, if it's a boy, keep it. If it's a girl, expose it. And we have archaeological digs where there were places that they would leave these babies to die and those babies' remains are there. Many of them are skeletons. But not all those babies were left there. Many of them were taken and raised as prostitutes. Later on, the Christians would take those babies, most of them girls, and raise them as their own. And so another a great writer from our time period who wrote The Rise of Christianity uh, says that one of the reasons he thinks Christianity grew in the Roman Empire is because they had all the girls. And so the, the, they'd have to turn to the Christian community to even find spouses, something you're kind of seeing happening now. Did you see in China they're thinking about having a woman be shared by two men because there's not enough women there? And because of the one-child policy that they had, that was just in the news a few days ago, was it's theorized that that was the Roman world, that there were not enough women for the men, and that because the Christians raised the girl. It was a brutal, it was a violent, it was an ugly world. He says more and more that he would never in a million years want to have lived in that world. But what about the world before that? Well, look at the Assyrians. There was a reason Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. 
because they were so brutal that they would make engraved reliefs of the ways in which they tortured and maimed people in their violence of skinning people alive, impaling their bodies on these posts, piling up skulls as they went into these towns. And they did, they would travel, the Assyrians would travel as families to war. And the whole family would get involved in ransacking and destroying villages. It was a way of life, violence, it was brutal. Uh, one of my favorite depictions of the world BC is the book The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. And all seven of his books are kind of about the Christian story, but that one book is the Christian story as a whole told, if you've ever read that children's book. And in that children's book, these children from England are sent from London, which is being bombed during World War II, to stay with a professor out, out of the city so they can be away from the bombardment. And they go through a wardrobe into a magical world they find. But this magical world has become under the power of a foreign power that is keeping it always winter and never Christmas. This foreign power who does the depiction of the devil is the white witch. But I thought that image of a world that's always winter and not Christmas has not happened yet. That's the world BC where there hasn't been a Christmas yet. As someone who grew up in northern Wisconsin, I can tell you that winter can be brutal, harsh, and unforgiving. Just a few years ago, and they've had two really, really brutal northern Wisconsin winters uh, where my family's from. In fact, some of them are like saying, I don't know how long I can live here anymore. And I've listened to the radio, like the WCCO talk radio from up there, where people are calling in saying, this is getting ridiculous, these brutal cold winters. But just a couple years ago, right in the very towns where my family is, a man from St. Louis was up there. He was a truck driver, and he was up there doing deliveries in Wisconsin. He was up there during one of those times when it was a very brutal winter night. And he was driving. You know, when we were up there just a few weeks ago, Max remarked at about 8 o'clock, I can't believe it's 8 o'clock. It looks like 5 because so, it stays light there a lot longer. Fourth of July, you have to usually wait till after 10 o'clock before it even gets dark enough to do your fireworks. It's really a bizarre, kind of like Canada or like Alaska that way, you know how it stays sometimes. But when it comes wintertime then, you have like no light. And this guy, he's from St. Louis, he's driving up there. Probably was fairly early, but it was pitch black. And it was pouring down snow or snowing heavily. And the man could not tell the road from the not road. And he drives into one of the many lakes that's all around there in northern Wisconsin. He escapes, but he's drenched. And he starts walking, but he never makes it. And they found him. He had froze to death. And, but that's not uncommon because it seems like every winter, tourists from Chicago will go up there and they'll go snowmobiling. And one of the things when they go snowmobiling is they'll go from these resorts to resorts on these lakes, kind of bar hopping, right? Well, when you're bar hopping, well, then you're not always in the best state of mind to be driving out there in the frigid cold in the middle of the woods. And it's not uncommon every year for someone up there to be found dead somewhere. And so C.S. Lewis takes that picture of the brutal, unforgiving harshness of winter, and he says, that's the world B.C. You know, we look back now, and some people wonder, why did they change it from B.C. to A.D.? Because they knew the difference. They hadn't been that far away from that kind of a world. They saw how things had changed. We live now after 2,020 years, and Tom Holland says this in various interviews he's in, that, uh, that people just take for granted that human beings are the way we experience them today. People who champion things like compassion and tolerance and justice and human rights. He says you had none of that in the ancient world. His most recent book from 2019 is Dominion. Uh, the, um, the first subtitle was The Making of the Western Mind. Dominion, the making of the Western mind. The newest subtitle is Dominion, how the Christian revolution changed the world. Because he became convinced that it wasn't the Greeks, it wasn't the Romans that has made Western culture what it is. And he made this point that it's the letters of Paul and the four Gospels have been the most powerful books that have literally changed the world. And everything we experience as normal today for human values and human beliefs owe their origins to this appearing of the Christ. 
We sing it so well at Christmas time. Because remember, he said, it's always winter, but never Christmas. That's B.C. But then Christmas comes, and we sing, Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared, and the soul felt his worth. The thrill of hope, a weary world rejoices. Oh, yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees. That's the message of this going on in this passage here is that Jesus says uh, what, 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 what they weren't able to do in the Old Testament. They weren't able to bring in the, the obedience to the law that they were to mediate to the world as a kingdom of priests when they were given the Ten Commandments. Because what does it mean to be unclean? Remember, he says, you're going to go out and you're going to drive out unclean spirits. Well, Jesus tells us what it means to be unclean. He says in Matthew 15, just a few chapters later, it's not that what goes into a man that makes him unclean, but what comes out of the heart makes him unclean. Murder, he's going through the Ten Commandments, beginning in Commandment 6. Murder, adultery, sexual sin, which is continuing with adultery, theft, you shall not steal, false testimony, false witness, slander. Jesus says this is what is an unclean spirit. This is what the unclean spirits inspire. You look at the ancient world, killing, sexual sin, robbing, pillaging, destroying. Jesus comes and he begins this work of driving out the unclean spirits. And he chooses the 12 apostles to say, I'm reconstituting the mission of Israel. We're going to take this thing and we're going to make it happen. And now the new people of God representing the ongoing completion of this mission, you're to be the kingdom of priests. You're to go out into the world and continue this mission. I like what Ulrich Luz, a uh, commentator on this passage, says. Jesus responds to Israel's suffering by calling the 12 Israelites to himself. Do you hear what he, he said? It says that Jesus had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Their lives were being driven about by the false spirit, the devil. And just like the God of the Old Testament, when he looked at the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11, and he saw them all harassed and helpless and going all over because of their sin, and it was uh, his judgment on them that they became that way, but rather than saying, I'm just going to give up on these people, you have Abraham in Genesis 12. I'm choosing you, Abraham, so that I can bless these people and get their lives right. And that was Israel's mission when they were to be a kingdom of mediators of the covenant. They were to be those who were chosen to be special and set apart and dedicated to God so that they would mediate to the world its true way of being, which is enshrined in the Ten Commandments. But Jesus comes and he says, now it's going to happen because now the kingdom of heaven has come near. I love how he says it just a little bit later when he says, and this is in Matthew chapter 12, if by the spirit of God I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. The kingdom of God has appeared and I'm driving the devil out. He says, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? He says, I've come into the world. I have bound the devil's ability. He's no longer able to keep the whole world under his sway, and I'm taking from him these people who are bound by him. See, again, in the C.S. Lewis story, when the king suddenly appears, when Christmas happens for the first time, Father Christmas appears in the story, Aslan, who's the Christ figure, appears, what happens? Suddenly all the snow is beginning to melt. Aslan breathes his breath like Jesus breathed on the disciples in John, on those who have been turned hardened to stone, and he sets them free. A great hymn by Charles Wesley says, He breaks the power of canceled sin and sets the captive free. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. We're living in that age, the age of the spread of the knowledge of God. And we are the beneficiaries. Even the people who are against Christianity can't help but use the ideas, the concepts, the beliefs that are shaped by Christianity. They actually use it against Christianity, but they don't realize they're using that which was given to them by Christianity. The very idea of being compassionate. In his book, After You Believe, uh, N.T. Wright names four virtues that were not to be found anywhere in the world until Christ. Humility, patience, chastity, and charity. 
Tom Holland brings that point up, that idea of one man, one woman, chastity, that that was what undermined slavery to begin with because it said each person had the right to their own body, to their own relationship with their spouse, and you could not violate that. And he makes this great point, because you hear sometimes today in the talk about our past history of slavery, well, Paul condoned it, and that's why these Christians in the 1800s went ahead and did slavery. And Tom Holland, who still is not yet a believer, but who has written already all this stuff about how Christianity is what really made Western culture what it is, he says that's absolutely not the case. That everything Paul wrote was meant to be this leaven, or what he calls it a depth charge, that eventually would undermine all of the foundations of all of this that is wrong in the world. And we are the beneficiaries of that depth charge or that leaven. And so as we sing in that same great Christmas hymn, chains shall he break, for the slave is our brother. All that because of Jesus Christ. And again, the subtitle of his new book is how the Christian revolution changed the world because he makes the case that it's through the Western culture that's been shaped by the appearance of the Christ that you have people talk about human rights and dignity and all these things at the United Nations that they would never talk about if it weren't through the influence of the Christ. And so Allah says the disciples' discourse begins with compassion for the people without a shepherd. Matthew thus makes clear that discipleship is fundamentally related to the people. That is its mission. The church is AO ipso, that is, as a fact of, based on this, a missionary community. That's what we are. We're a missionary community. Matthew thus presents the mission of the 12 as the prototype of the continuing mission of the church. We have a mission. Our mission is to go out into all the world and proclaim the news of the true king, the king of heaven, who is bringing the king of, uh, kingdom of heaven here as he's driving out the unclean spirits that hold people in the lives of murder, adultery, sexual sin, theft, slander, false witness, all those things that are wrong according to the Decalogue that was given to Israel. Our mission is to go out and to proclaim that news which will set those people free. Which brings me to the end of Matthew's gospel. At the end of Matthew's gospel, Matthew 24, he does talk about the end of the world and when Jesus finally comes. But it's not about us speculating. He doesn't say we should be speculating about when that one comes. He says, blessed is that servant whose master finds him busy doing his master's work. And that's the message to us today. I don't know when the end is going to be. But I do know what I'm supposed to be doing until that end comes. I'm to be out there driving the devil out. I'm to be out there preaching the word that sets the captives free and breaks the chains that binds them and continuing that mission of expanding the, the kingdom of God as I preach the word of God. And as we do that, well, then we'll be ready, Jesus says. If you're doing that, then don't worry about it because when that day comes, the master is going to find you ready. And you'll be ready for when that day finally comes. And there'll be no more of this sorrow, sickness, heartache, pain. Jabal, means we pray. Father, we thank you for the great, wonderful mission you have given us as a church. And for the blessings of this land we live in that we're celebrating this Saturday. And we uh, acknowledge, we humbly bow before Christ as the true author of the liberties we know in this land. That... Those who wrote those founding documents were nested in a culture that they were indelibly shaped by, one that caused them to write all are created equal and endowed by their creator. And those were things that did not appear in a vacuum, but they appeared A.D. in the year of our Lord, 1776. And we thank you, Lord, that we live in the year of the Lord, 2020, and are on this side of his appearing, where we celebrate every year the joy of Christmas, of his appearing. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.